Welcome back to Hashtag Single with Jeanette Bonner. I am not a relationship expert or sex therapist. I'm just a regular New York City woman navigating the world as a single, independent feminist. Hashtag Single is about having honest conversations with other singles in today's device-obsessed culture. So I hope you'll join me on this interesting, challenging, and complex journey as we navigate the ins and outs of singledom. I'm Jeanette, your host. You are listening to Hashtag Single. Of course you are. Thank you so much for joining us. So excited to have you with us here today for this episode. You may or may not know, uh, we are in the middle of our second annual, can I say that? Makes me feel fancy. Second annual author series. I had a triplet of author series episodes in 2021, and it was so wonderful and inspiring. I decided to do it again for 2022. So this being the second month of 2022, I have my second author joining me for a very juicy, pun intended, and you'll soon learn why, author for you this month. She has a new book that's coming out just in time for Valentine's Day, which is not a holiday we acknowledge on Hashtag Single, but we know it's on the calendar. Rachel Kramer Bustle is here with us today. Rachel, thank you so much for being on Hashtag Single with me. Thank you for having me. There's so much to talk about. So as we start all of our guest expert episodes, I'm going to read you guys a little bit of a bio so you're familiar with Rachel and Rachel's work. It is lengthy because she's a badass. Just wait till you hear what she has accomplished. Rachel is a New Jersey-based author, journalist, copywriter, anthology editor, erotica writing teacher, consultant, and event organizer. She is an award-winning author of over 70 erotica anthologies, which have won eight independent Publisher Awards and three of those publications, The Big Book of Submission Volume 2, Dirty Dates and Surrender won the National Leather Association Samoa Anthology Award. In addition to her anthologies, Rachel's written countless articles about sex and dating for media outlets such as Glamour, The New York Times, Oprah Magazine, Penthouse, and Rolling Stone, among others. She has appeared on The Gail King Show, The Martha Stewart Show, The Berman and Berman Show, New York One, and Showtime's Family Business. She hosted the popular In the Flesh erotica reading series in New York City. She speaks at conferences such as the LA Times Festival of Books, South by Southwest, and the American Association of Journalists and Authors. And she teaches erotica writing workshops around the world and online, including at universities such as University of Pennsylvania, Northwestern, and SUNY Purchase, and even at the New York 92nd Street Y. Rachel holds a bachelor's degree in political science and women's studies from the University of California at Berkeley. Her recent book, Coming Soon, Women's Orgasm Erotica, was released last July And if that wasn't enough, this year she has a brand new anthology coming out on February 8th, and it is called The Big Book of Orgasms, Volume 2. Damn, girl, when do you breathe? (laughs) Okay, I will say, because that's like, I was like, oh, I could interrupt and tell her, like, it's too long. But, um... (laughs) Those are, no, you should never dim those accomplishments. No, not to dim the accomplishments, it's just... Like, I will say, I'm 46, so I have been doing this for around 20 years. So just to give a little context, I have been doing this for a long time. Which That's is- fine, but, like, anybody that reaches any age to have accomplished I- – I just love how multifaceted you are. Like, being an author, but also doing conferences, but also being an anthologist editor, and also doing workshops around erotica. Like, it's just – it's just – I don't know. It's phenomenal. It's so cool. Congratulations. Thank you. It's really, um, I think what's really cool, like probably the best thing about what I do is that the writing is usually kind of lonely. I mean, not always because some of it is journalism and I'm calling people or emailing people, talking to them for articles, but the actual act of writing, I'm doing it by myself. I mean, I'm also editing by myself, but I get to interact with authors from all over the world and I've published over 700 authors in my books, which to me is just so cool because they're so interesting. I mean, their, their writing is interesting and it's very varied and they write things I could never write, even if I was at my computer for 
like a whole year, but also they do cool things like a lady I published in one of my books uh, like a year or two ago, she teaches cooking classes and she lives in Mexico and I got to take one of her cooking classes online. And I just oh. think that's so cool. And like, I would not have come across her probably if she hadn't sent her story to my book. I'm such a people person. It really is a nice temper to some of the loneliness and like just mm. the just the solitary nature of being a writer because I mean, I love what I do, but there's only so much sitting at your computer by yourself. <laughs> right. Like right. that that I can handle, you know? <laughs> yeah. And a lot of writers happen to have chosen that life because they're introverts. So it's really interesting to hear from someone that considers themselves a, a people person who uses writing in order to connect with a broader circle of people, not just sort of like in a theoretical way, but in an actual person to person way. And I will say I do consider myself an introvert, but I'm also a people person. Like I'll do events. Um, I'm doing a Twitter spaces for this book where we're chatting and mm. I'll do online events like a Zoom event. And it is different to just read someone's words on a page versus see them reading their own words and talking about them. And I think getting to edit people's work it's just a cool insight into into another culture that, I, you know, I don't know if I will ever go to the Philippines, but there's a story I published in a different book about a, a single woman in the Philippines. It's called On the Calendar by Kate Sebastian, and she's waiting to have a relationship, and she hasn't yet, and she's getting to a point where people are starting to say like, oh, you're still single. So <laughs> so it's it was just an interesting insight because, you know, her the expectations for her were a little different than I think they are for most people in the United States. And she was able to turn that into an erotica story while also giving readers a sense of what that feeling is like in a yeah. specific place. And so I, I really feel like I'm very lucky to just constantly have all this input of different viewpoints and yeah. different perspectives because I'm just one person and yes I have an imagination and I don't only write about things that have happened to me and I love that like I love that to discover that and to share that with readers that's a that's a wonderful point I, I just think it, like, it enhances your creativity and your access to other points of view yeah and I think that does extend into real life I mean I can't speak for anyone else but I can definitely say having read so much erotica for pleasure and for my work, that has expanded my idea of what sex can be and what desire mm. can be and like what turns people on. And I think a lot of people, I mean, they might sort of know there's a larger world out there, but they might also feel like, okay, what I think is sexy is kind of what everyone else thinks is sexy, especially if you're never discussing it with anyone else. Yeah, yeah. So I think erotica can just give you anyone and a way to just think about sex in different ways, whether or not those ways are things that turn you on or not. I think it's still valuable to to get insight into, you know, what it's like to be a, like a foot fetishist or a, you know, someone who's turned on by submission or, you know, and I think, I think people are a lot more complex than sometimes we give them credit for. Yeah. I'm so fascinated that you've chosen a life and a career that centers around sex, dating, feminism, and body image. I'd love to know, you know, how did you arrive here? How did you get started in this genre? When did you know you wanted to write about these topics specifically? And and also, can we just acknowledge, what's the deal with that poli sci major? Just oh, well, poking in there yes, like a hangnail. Yes, well that, <laughs> yes, I've, I've done a lot of different things. I guess when I was studying political science and then I went to law school, which is not in my oh bio my because, wait, because I didn't finish. But this is all when I started writing erotica. So um, to I get think, you through law school? Well, kind of, yeah. Like oh, I, yes. well, okay. So I think in college, I thought I was going to either be a lawyer or work in politics. Like I was always interested in like formal politics, like campaigns and things. Okay. And then I went to law school in New York and 
there was a lot to do in New York that had nothing to do with law school that was just super fun. Like I went to a ton of concerts and I went to sex parties for the first time. And I just, just doing all these things that were way more interesting than going to school. (laughs) And some of that was reading erotica and then trying to write my own erotica. Um, Uh And I think the less I went to school, the more I was indulging all these other interests. Not something I recommend. Like, if you are not into your school, I would say drop out and then get a job. But let's advocate for, like, pursuing your curiosity and your interests and being aware of, like, you know what? I'm actually so much less interested in the thing I'm supposed to be doing. And I put that in quotes. And yes. my curiosity is leading me to this thing. I should explore that. And it really was. Like, looking back, it was never okay, I'm going to leave law school and become an erotica writer or even leave law school and become a writer. Like it was more, I don't know, just this clearly is not a good fit and I don't know what I'm going to do. So eventually I left law school, did not um, have a degree and I just got random admin jobs, whatever I could, but I was writing on the side some like articles, some erotica and then through the erotica I was writing, um, I got asked to interview at Penthouse Variations, which was a sub magazine of Penthouse, like a smaller version that was kind of kinky. Mm. And I got that job. And so basically, I left a job where I was a typist at an insurance company, (laughs) which was extremely boring. I mean, I literally typed handwritten notes that people made. Yes. And their handwriting was atrocious. So it was... um, It was not the most fun or stimulating mentally. It was just very boring. Then everything kind of aligned. Like I was writing erotica and I was starting to edit anthologies about it. And I was editing stories at the magazine during the day. And then I started a reading series so I could, you know, host people and have an audience for this stuff. And then I was a sex columnist for the Village Voice. So I was writing about my own life and it was all kind of around sex and dating and it was a really fun time like I was in my I think late 20s early 30s and I was single for most of that time like I had some short relationships but um, you know I was very free and could just kind of do whatever I wanted and I was writing about my own life and then I was writing fiction sometimes about my life sometimes made up and it was a career path that I had to create like now Mm -hmm. I teach erotica writing classes and I've been trying to think when did I start doing that because a lot of my friends are sex educators of some kind and I thought well people probably want to know how to write erotica but I had to come up with the curriculum for that all on my own based on things I had learned so Mm -hmm. I would say overall my career it was definitely not what I thought it would be when I graduated college. Like It's so great. It's I totally it. different. And it's always evolving because, you know, now I work for myself. So I, I can do not kind of whatever I want because I still, you know, I need a publisher to publish my books. I need editors to hire me to write articles. But I do think I have more control because I do a lot of different things. I don't know. It still feels almost like a happy accident. For me, it was, I was reading a lot of it and I saw a call for submissions for an anthology of short stories around celebrities and it was called Starfucker. <laughs> and this, the, the editor had had a zine called Starfucker. This was around 1990. 899 and perfect so zine time yes <laughs> i wrote a story called monica and me that was about yes. monica lewinsky because she was super big in the news and oh my God. this was inspired by a very specific article in one of the tabloids like i want to say maybe national Enquirer or star and it said something like monica lewinsky had a crush on a woman who worked in the white house I and mean, i don't remember the details of like where they got this information but I saw that and I thought, well, that is really interesting. What if, you know, she was bisexual? So basically the story was a fantasy because I I am bisexual and I had a crush on her. I thought she was really fascinating and she lived in New York. I lived in New York. So I wrote this story that was basically about my fantasy about her. And today I'm not sure if I would write that about a real person, like a regular person who 
became famous kind right, of against right, right. their will. But I did write that story and it got published in that Starfucker book. And then <laughs> it kind of took on a life of its own because several years after that, I met a woman at a reading who came up to me after and said, did you write that Monica story? And I said, yes. And she was also interested in Monica. She had a crush on her. And then we started dating. So we met because of that story. Yes, I know. It's kind of crazy. And um, we broke up, but we're still friends. And like, we still talk about that. And that was like this full circle moment. It was so Mm -hmm. funny. But, you know, I've written about tons of things that I don't know where the interest in writing that comes from necessarily like that's part of the magic to me like I might sit down with a rough outline of what I want to write or an idea um and then when I actually write it it sometimes comes out much um more complicated than than I expected it to and I love that feeling like I love when I don't know where it's going but I but you know it's like bubbling up from wherever your creative ideas bubble up from sure Well, let's dive into your books here because we keep talking about them, but I want to really introduce them to people who are not familiar with it or not familiar with erotica in the first place. Um, But before we begin, I have to share with you, (laughs) speaking of personal experiences, I just have to share with you my own experience around the book because, you know, when I was thinking about recording this podcast with you today, it occurred to me how really meta it all was. So... I do most of my reading on the on the trains here in New York City. You probably know because, you know, there's like no signal between stations. It's yeah. pretty quiet. And, you know, you can be on it for a good stretch of time, like 45 minutes to an hour. So and I had this post-it by my door to remind me. It says read erotica on the train, <laughs> you know, as you do. So this is what I'm doing. And I'm very intently, you know, doing my homework, reading your book. Did you have the book like Brett, like could people no, because I don't just... have a paper copy. So oh, you phone. don't have a paper yeah, copy. Yeah. But how oh, great okay. would that be? I know it would have been fabulous. So I'm, I'm in a very public place, and you know, once in a while, a big New York dude would like sit down next to me or across from me, and I suddenly became very self-aware, and I found myself thinking, if only they knew what I was reading, or I wonder if my face looks different. That's but so interesting. Today I was on my way home, my way home from a COVID test of all things, <laughs> super mundane things, and I was reading a story that really like got me, you know, like more than the previous stories had. It was in the coming soon book. And all I could think of was, can these men sense that I'm aroused? First of all, that in itself could be like the premise of I know. Well, that's what I'm saying is super meta because I was thinking, oh, my God, I've come full circle because the books both often address women's secret desires coming to life. And I was thinking, you know, this in itself is kind of hot, like having this very private but active Mm. inner life going on in a public setting around people that have no idea what you're imagining. You know, it kind of reminded me of that feeling, you know, that feeling you've after you've had like really good sex, like even the next morning and you're just going about your day and all you can think about is how you're acting all normal on the outside. (laughs) But your brain and your body and your senses are all like on fire on the inside. That is such a, I wish there was like a word for that. Yeah, it's just this like, I've got a secret feeling. I will say, I mean, I'll probably say this again at the end, but I accept submissions from my anthologies and I post them publicly and there are three up right now on my website. So uh, if you want to write or if any of you listening want to write, and I, I can't guarantee I can publish anyone's story because, you know, just by the numbers, I get way more than I have room for. Totally. Um, but I think it's just so, I think it can be so fun and creative and exciting to write an erotica story and see what happens. And, you know, whether it gets accepted or rejected by me or any other editor, there's other publications out there, but it, it just can be such a good feeling to to do that and get your vision onto the page and I I did want to circle back, though. I think what makes that experience you were talking about interesting is that, like, you were in total control of it. Like, I think in the fantasy, anything could happen, right? I I think that's why fantasies in general are so cool, because you're in control of them. Like, you, they go the way you want them to go. Whereas in real life, sometimes things do, and sometimes things don't. Of course. But I, I, and I do think, like, when you start writing a lot of erotica, and you're always trying to come up with ideas, you start looking around you and seeing possibilities for erotica in like all 
sorts of situations. And they don't all have to be situations like that. They can also be things that in real life are super annoying, like you're waiting online at the DMV or, you know, you're on hold. Like, imagine if in fantasy life, like you could just transform that and be like, okay, I'm stuck online at the DMV, but I'm wearing vibrating panties and like, I'm secretly, <laughs> make this hot? you know, yeah. getting off. I mean, like, it's cool to think about, you know, and yeah, I think it's fun to fantasize about. And that's what I think erotica does for a lot of people, especially, you know, people who maybe are in or either whatever your situation, like whether you're single or whether you're in a relationship or whether you're happily single or happily in a relationship or not, or like, or the other way, you know, I think erotica can just expand your mind and turn you on and just, yes. And I, I like being able to offer a lot of different points of view. You know, the big book of orgasms, volume two and the first volume, they all have 69 stories. That's a lot of stories. I don't necessarily expect every person to be like, I loved every one of these 69 stories, like, I'm sure people are going to have favorites. We're all different. And, and also, like, I don't think you can really predict which ones you're going to like. Often, I think sometimes people go into erotica thinking, well, I might read about this, but I'm not into spanking or I'm not into whatever. So I wouldn't read about that. And that's fine. Like, I'm not saying don't have preferences. But I also think it it can behoove you to be open-minded because a good writer can get you into a story and and keep you there and make you want to keep yeah. reading, even if that's not your thing in real life. Yeah, yeah. That's actually the success of a good writer is like to be like, can oh, I didn't think I was going to get this thing. But by like, their I'm writing, super on board. make you yeah. want to know what happens and make you care about those characters yes. and, or just make you intrigued and to me, that's really what the erotica writer's job is to to turn people on and to entertain them and just to make them want to know what happens next. Yeah. So just to bring everyone into your world here, as I mentioned, Rachel has two anthologies that she sent me. One is called Coming Soon, Women's Orgasm Erotica, and it has 20 stories and is 250 pages. And the other is The Big Book of Orgasms, Volume 2, which, as she mentioned, has 69 stories and is 400 pages. So um, I'd love to hear from you. You know, what to you is the biggest differentiation between the two books? Because I thought I felt there was a lot of crossover in them, but I'd love to hear from you what, what your perspective on the two different books bring to people. Well, definitely. I mean, they're both themed around orgasm. And sometimes people have said to me, well, duh, like, of course, it's erotica. There's orgasms. But I there's think... There's got to be an end to the story. <laughs> there's, I mean, yes, you're going to find orgasms in my other books too. But I think making orgasm the theme really highlights different ways uh people can have orgasms and also the different motivations for having an orgasm and like something I'm always interested in as an editor and this might be the opposite of what people think it would be but is the psychological motivation like the mental turn on or like things like you know why does dirty talk turn people on you know versus like possibly getting caught having sex somewhere you're not supposed to be having sex. Like, to me, those things are really interesting. And I would say the difference is, one is the length, like in the Big Book of Orgasms, because there's so many stories, they're much shorter. They're all Mm -hmm. about 1,200 words or less. So that's usually four to five pages. I also think it's a great one to read, you know, to someone or like if, you know, if you're on a date or if you're, maybe you're um, long distance or you're flirting with someone or whatever like phone sex because like they're they're quick I I think it's fun to read erotica with a partner um because sort of the pressure is off you to create a scenario right like someone else has created a scenario and then you're both thinking about it I mean you're both probably picturing something but you might be picturing slightly different things or you might be relating to different aspects of of the characters like and and I and I think also there's just so much possibility for self-discovery because I think especially as we get older, sometimes we think, oh, well, in when I was this age, I was into this. So this is who I am. And I think we're all capable of changing sexually and otherwise, but you're not sort of stuck with what, what turned you on at a, you know, when you 10 years ago or however many years ago, like you, there might be something new that turns you on that you just haven't discovered yet and yeah. erotica might help you do that I love that I didn't count the in the big book of orgasms um 
But it's interesting to note that of your 20 authors in coming soon, 18 of them were female identifying. Yeah. So I was just curious if you intentionally chose female identifying authors or do you think that female identifying authors are more driven to create erotica than male ones? That is an interesting question. So I think for that one, because the theme was women's orgasm erotica, most of the authors who submitted work to me um, were women, but not exclusively. For the big book of orgasms, there is a much wider range of genders, both um, like within the stories and who sent me stories. And, you know, I think both have their kind of uh, benefits. Like, I mean, in some ways, from what I've been told, calling a book like Women's Erotica, which I also edit a series called Best Women's Erotica of the Year, is a, is a marketing thing. And I definitely know that there are men who read the Best Women's Erotica series. I mean, my sense is there are generally people who are partnered with women or who are attracted to women who want to know, like, what turns women on. What turns on. them on? That's what I said. I'm thinking, like, any smart man would pick that up and be like, okay, but some um, secrets here. But yeah, it is important to think about who you're reading is excluding. I think that that could be said for any genre, but, you know, I think you can definitely learn about not just sex and not just gender, but just people by reading beyond your personal experience. And Mm -hmm. I think that's something you will find in the big book of orgasms. I mean, there's, there's just there, you know, there's a story set on Mars. There's a story about a masturbating pregnant woman. Um, there's a story, there are like science fiction stories and there's car sex and there's just, there's historical, you know, and there's just all sorts of things. And I will say sometimes people are like, what's the secret to getting published in your anthologies? And there is no secret. I mean, the secret is write a good story that's right. totally well, t- different from what I already have, have as much variety as possible because I don't want them to feel bored or like, oh, I just read that. So sometimes if that happens, but I really like two stories that are similar in that way, like plot wise, I will say, okay, I can't use it in this one, but I'm editing this other book about this other topic. Maybe I could use it there. And that's actually how I get ideas for anthologies. Like right now I'm doing one on called Sexy Strangers. And that was inspired by stories I got for a different anthology that I couldn't use because I ran out of space, but where I was like, these are all really good and they're all about strangers. So, so I get ideas all the time from um, just what people are writing about there's some words and some themes that seem to come up again and again for for me or what I noticed both in the stories themselves but you know also in your faux words I wanted to just get your thoughts on them sure the word power and the word authority are frequent Mm. as were the themes of sort of relinquishing inhibitions and acting on it or letting go of secret desires in order to as you say to make you come alive I know that the big book of orgasms wasn't necessarily like written for women but you know in that I don't know if you know the ones that I read at least the majority of the protagonists I read were women so I'm just curious, like, coming that, around those themes, are women to be more likely to harbor secret desires or to inhibit their natural desires, in your opinion? I mean, I do think that this really relates to what life is like in our society, where, yes, it's 2022, but there's still a lot of judgment. There's still slut shaming. There's still right. sort of things that maybe are not taboo but are still maybe a little frowned upon i mean i i'm talking about even things such as like the number or like sex on the first date which i mean i just remember i went out with someone now this might be 15 years ago something like that we had a great first date and then we made out and took a like cab back to his place and we had sex and i stayed over and i was like oh this was really fun he you know i liked him whatever I did not hear from him again for a really long time. And then he was like, I had a really good time, but that was just sort of too much too soon. And I'm not saying he was slut shaming me. Like he wasn't rude about it or anything, but clearly like us having sex on the first date. He put you in a box. He labeled you. He kind of couldn't handle it. And I just thought it was really interesting because I mean, what should I have not acted on wanting to continue having a good time with him because I wanted to maybe have a future with him. Like I just could never play those games. And I think 
there's still expectations put on women and there's still things that are often used against women, whether it's someone you're dating or someone else like wants to throw something at you and then they want to throw at you, you dress too slutty, you do this. I mean, there's just so many still, I think, things that women are not supposed to do. And I will say, I don't think it's only women. I think other genders also face that. I think especially like if you look at men who are submissive, that is not as acceptable in our society. Yeah, totally. I, you know, I think that's still kind of seen as, oh, well, you know, if they're submissive in the bedroom, what does that mean about them as a person, as a man, as a this? Yeah. So I think there are still a lot of things that are in real life, you know, we're not as accepting as maybe we think we are. And a lot of that, I feel like shows up in erotica. Yeah. I think speaking from like a female point of view and a straight female point of view, I think there's, um, as you said, you know, even though it's an old topic, it's still present. This this fear of judgment. If I act a certain way, I'm going to be shamed or I'm going to be blamed or I'm going to be judged or I'm going to be made fun of in some way. So that that diffuses the power, the agency that we have. And And so a lot of us are afraid to act on our actual desires for fear of that judgment. And I know that example I gave was from someone I had dated, but I think slut shaming also happens within friend groups. I mean, I'm really lucky, like the friends that I have and had a, a times when I was single were are very open-minded and like we could talk about sex and share stories and like no one was judging anyone but I do think there is also judgment among peers there is where like oh like that's cool that you did that thing but not that thing or like you got all you like you know you did this but you took your clothes off here or you took nude foot or whatever I mean I think there's still that judgment kind of but why did you do this or like you know, and and this bleeds into like real life topics like revenge porn. I think a lot of people's first question is yeah. not why is someone, you know, maliciously using your nude photos. It's why did you take why nude you photos take in, the in the first place? place? And I think in erotica, it gives authors a space to not have those judgments that yeah. we do have, unfortunately, still in real life. Yeah, absolutely. I want to hear what your favorite stories are and that this isn't about uh, like coming from an author perspective as a reader I know on yeah. a personal level what fantasy Rachel you oh. liked the best from what your author sent you I'm happy to go first oh. if you want me to break the ice oh sure okay you go first well I'll, I already mentioned it so I'll bring it back up so I talked about that story I read on the train that like really got me kind of turned on and it was the story Adorn So Adorn is about a woman visiting a friend in Paris who hasn't had sex in over a year, but um, I think she also hasn't had an orgasm in over a year due to a a bad previous relationship that ended and other factors that had her sort of subduing her sex life. And she goes to a photography exhibit with said friend and comes to find that the pictures are erotica. And the friend tells her that she herself has modeled for the photographer and that, that this friend should also... And at first she's reluctant, but then she spends time with the photographer. She decides she wants to do this. So she goes to the studio and his photos have her posing naked with jewels, hence the title Adorn. Um, and the posing leads to to sex with a photographer, which also gets photographed by an assistant. <laughs> and then those photos end up in the next gallery showing. So I was trying to think, like, what was it about this one story that just, like, really really got me going more than the others and I put down my phone for a second I sat there and I thought like what what is this telling me Jeanette and I remember this thing I used to tell my ex-boyfriend uh and I said to him every woman wants to go into a room feeling like she is the most beautiful woman in the room to the one that she wants and it's this idea of like feeling desired and being seen sort of both by the photographer but then also by the audience like of the art gallery it was that like appreciation and of the expression of desire I think that was really intriguing to me I like the way you phrased that because I think that's like I think a good relationship or a good lover will make you feel like you can do anything and you're you're in a safe space I mean I know that phrase gets kind of bandied about but like where you can and not just to do anything but to say anything because like going back to the what we were just talking about I think sometimes even in like dirty talk and fantasies sometimes 
you know, it can feel like, oh, you can say anything, but then you say the one thing and then they're like, oh. It triggers them, yeah. <laughs> and and I get it. Like, I don't necessarily think you have, you're obligated to be turned on by everything your partner says, but I do think if you are a good partner, you have to at least be supportive of the, of them sharing a fantasy. You don't have to share the fantasy, but like, I think you have to be open to that because that's like what intimacy is about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell me, tell me what your personal one favorite, of my, if you're open okay. to it. Well, like this what, is, I'm going to say it's one of my favorites and this is super, oh, sure, yeah. this is super nerdy, but I am super nerdy. Okay. Like, I don't know how many books I have probably like, I don't know, maybe a thousand or something. I used to have more, but like a many moves, I had to like winnow them down. I had so many books that a truck like drove onto our lawn and the truck started to sink because I had like 20 boxes of books. So um, there's a story called Biblio by Lynn Devon in the Big Book of Orgasms, volume two. And it's about a woman in a bookstore yes bookstore right not a library but anyway she works in this bookstore and she is basically like fondling these books and imagining authors like Anais Nin and um uh Thoreau like whispering in her ear and it to me that's such a like romantic and sexy Mm -hmm. notion that books and writers have this power to to do these things to us. And then, you know, in, in the fantasy, it's the actual writers and it's just, I don't know, it's playful and like smart and sexy. And it just, I I think it really evokes the idea of a bookstore to me because she's there alone, like not like with like crazy bright lights and like a million people running around, but just a very sensual, intimate experience with books and like with your own imagination too I just thought that was that was really fun and also kind of kind of sweet I I think there's kind of a mix there's some stories that I feel like are for lack of a better word just dirty like down and dirty and filthy and wild and I love those too I think it's also like what are you in the mood for and then there's there's some that are a little more romantic or tender or lighthearted or whatever um and then some are humorous too um I think that's also something underrated humor and sometimes it's subtle humor but sometimes it's it's just it can be funny and sexy and I think also in real life sometimes sex is funny you know something funny happens and it's like do you laugh and kill the mood or like do you just laugh and go with it and then get back to the sexy moment and um I, that's, I think, more challenging for me as an author. I don't usually deliberately write funny stories. Sometimes they happen to be funny, but I don't sit down and say, I'm going to make everyone laugh. I think it's so, it's so beautiful that you're, that the story that came to mind first for you was, was set in a bookstore and was, um, the fantasy of story and the fantasy of, of word reaching through the ages. And I think mine, if you really want to break it down is like being photographed and I'm also an actor and I like being on camera, you know? So like, it really comes down to, as you know, as you say, like your own kind of personal love language and your own desires, but that doesn't prevent us from enjoying the other stories as well. I did want to say one more thing about that story, your story, the one yeah. you liked adorn. Cause I think there's something really powerful. Like the, another theme that just, I would say comes up a lot in my work and has come up in stories I edit is um, voyeurism and exhibitionism because there's just so many ways that can play out. And yeah. sometimes it's, um, you know, obvious like in the opening story in the big book of orgasm someone's it's the window being looked at through a window so it's like more literal but also I wrote a story once set in Joe's pub which it's a club in New York City (laughs) inspired this did not really happen but it was inspired by a show I saw there and it's called hands down it's in a book called um twisted edited by Allison Tyler and it's about a couple a man and a woman and he ties her wrists with I think it's like a scrunchie or something. So basically her wrists are tied under the table and she's having to like order food and kind of go about her business, like get, get a drink. And like, just like they have this secret where it's, it's not like she's, you know, naked on display in the middle of Joe's pub, but in a right. way it's more, it, not more it's like erotic, my train story. but it's, but it, yeah, it's like the, it is the secret. And 
I think there's something really powerful about having a secret like that where either only you know or only you and your partner know, but like it's possible someone else might find out. And, and I think the having of the secret is sexy in and of itself. Yeah. And going back to what we were talking about, those themes of, of power and agency and authority and that they can manifest themselves in different ways. And maybe that power and authority is like, I did this thing for myself and I don't need to share it with anybody else. And I think like in both erotica and real life, like that can be as simple, like maybe someone's just not wearing underwear and they normally do, or they're, they just bought a vibrator and they're about to go home and use it. Like, I think there is a power in our imagination or our anticipation mm, mm-hmm. and and even just having those accumulated experiences are part of what makes you you and sometimes like for me sometimes things come up from my past in my head just at random times so I'm like oh yeah that was a really hot thing I did you know 20 years ago like that was and <laughs> yeah. like I don't know why I think of it but like it's fun it's nice to like sort yeah. of have those little memories and Erotica is a really great way to like explore some of those things. And it's not always, the character isn't always me. The character might be someone totally, like might be a, a like a 70 year old man or someone who's very different from me, but they're having a similar experience to something I did. Absolutely. I want to end with uh, a really beautiful sentiment that you wrote in your foreword of coming soon. You wrote in this book, you'll find women and non-binary characters discover that what makes them come, what makes them ache, what makes them yearn, doesn't always stay the same throughout their lives, but can be an ongoing process of learning mixed with yearning. And I think you talked about this a little bit earlier, but I just wanted to honor that because I think that a lot of us associate sex with being one way or being frustrated with ourselves that things aren't the way that they were previously. And it's necessary to hear that our sex lives and our tastes are constantly evolving because we are constantly evolving and that's normal and healthy and okay. Definitely. And I mean, I can say I'm in my mid forties. I know a lot of people in their forties and older whose sexuality has changed in, in sometimes ways you'd expect and sometimes in ways you wouldn't have expected. Like I know a lot of people who maybe were not, were not single, like were married or partnered for a lot of their lives. And then they become single at like, let's say fifties. And then like a whole world open up, opens up for them, Mm, mm, you know, and like they have a space to discover things about themselves that either they hadn't thought about because they were, with a certain partner or they just hadn't thought about because whatever, they were busy with the rest of their life. And I, I think it's never too late to try new things in sex or otherwise. Yeah. I just think it's, it's such a beautiful idea and it takes the pressure I think off of us for having this prescribed sex life is if, if that's a thing you know but yeah. the, this sort of very patriarchal idea of that everything should be one way because that's why it's been presented to us most of our lives but maybe if we can just like step back and widen the scope and be like there's no rules do what makes you happy do what gives you pleasure you know don't no labels no judgment but just like pursuing things with your own curiosity and growing as you do yeah. And also like not feeling beholden. I mean, I know your your podcast is about being single, but like also to a partner or to a potential partner. Like I definitely am not mm-hmm. in favor of trying to change yourself, not inhibiting yourself or like, you know, taming yourself down to be more palatable to someone. Absolutely. And and that includes like in in, you know, even just in the dating or meeting people stage, I think it can be easy to think like, oh, well, I won't share this side of myself because what if they think this? And it's like at a certain point, like, where do you lose yourself? Yeah, 100 percent. Rachel, it's been so amazing to talk to you and to be brought into your world. I'm not going to lie. This is my first erotica that I've read. And it was even more tantalizing to read it on the subway. I'm so, so glad. I hope other people experience. will read it on the subway. I think I only want, I want to finish the books only on the subway <laughs> going forward because I think that might have been half the fun. Um, but it was funny because, like I said, I was approaching it from a very homework point of view. So maybe I wasn't giving myself enough space to really enjoy them or maybe I was making it more exciting for myself. I don't know. We'll try both ways and see what happens. But Either way, it's been a, a real joy to be introduced to your work, and I'm, I'm so excited for my listeners and for other people to be exposed to your work, too. Tell us where we can 
find your books? Are they all uh, online? Are they in actual bookstores? Both. Um, You can get them at your local bookstore. You can ask for them at your local library. Some libraries have them. Uh, Ebooks, wherever you buy ebooks, audiobooks. And you can also listen to free samples of the audiobooks at audible.com. And you can find me at rachelkramerbustle.com. And that's also where you can find the guidelines to my anthologies. And I'm on Twitter at Raquelita, R-A-Q-U-E-L-I-T-A. And then my full name, Rachel Kramer Bustle on Instagram. Cool. I'll be sure to tag you in all of our posts. You guys have all the information if you want to reach out to Rachel in terms of her classes or her workshops or um, any questions you might have if you're interested in reading or writing erotica. Hopefully we can connect you guys up. But either way, congratulations on your brand new book. I look forward to your next brand new book in like what, like three to four months probably, Rachel? Uh, actually, yes, July, <laughs> Crowded no, House. No, you're joking. Come on. No, no, for real. Threesome and group sex erotica. I, I Yeah, I'm just like. You're a machine. <laughs> I, I guess yeah I don't know I, I like I have so many ideas like I, I used to do it. one a year and then two a year I was like wait I want to do three a year fuck yeah don't <laughs> apologize don't apologize so good awesome thank cool. you so much this was so fun this thanks was so again fun. Rachel and thank you guys listening to this episode I hope you got something from it I hope it sort of unleashed your inner erotic I don't know if that means anything. But in any case, thank you so much for listening. As always, if this episode reminds you of a friend who might be erotica curious, whether as a writer or a listener, please please consider sharing it. And if you would also be so kind as to leave us a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this podcast, we would surely appreciate uh, it to help our other listeners find our podcast. Come join us over on Instagram at hashtag single pod and we will catch you in another two weeks with a brand new episode. That's it for this time. We will catch you later. Bye.